Ronald Reagan would get along with Tip O'Neill, and they'd sit down, and they'd make great deals for everybody. That's what the country's about, really. If, as a voter, you think what we need is more Republicans in Washington to cut a deal with Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, then I guess Donald Trump's your guy. Donald Trump priding himself on his skill as a deal maker, while Ted Cruz worries he'd do, Trump would do just that with the Washington establishment. And it's time now for our Sunday Group's indicated columnist, George Will, Lisa Lehrer, who covers national politics for the Associated Press, head of Heritage Action for America, Michael Needham, and Fox News political analyst, Juan Williams. Well, let's take a look at that latest Fox News poll in Iowa that we presented today for the first time. Trump is now up 11 points in the last two weeks. Cruz is down four points in the last two weeks. George, now that their truce has officially ended, has Trump gotten the better of Cruz? Too soon to say, and it's too soon to say whether Trump has done this. Remember, this was the week that Governor Branstad, six-term governor of Iowa and longest-serving governor in American history, came out against Ted Cruz, broke the tradition of governors remaining neutral in Iowa on the issue of ethanol, of all things, which is an important boondoggle to the economy of, of Iowa. Or a worthwhile <coughs> program if you're an Iowan. And <laughs> folks, I'll be heading out to Des Moines <laughs> on Tuesday. <laughs> Douglas, General Douglas MacArthur said that in war, every disaster can be explained by two words, too late. And the question is whether the conservative wing of the Republican Party, a.k.a. the Republican wing of the Republican Party, is beginning too late to rally against uh, Mr. Trump. It's also unclear yet whether the fire between Trump and Cruz is going to have the effect that the war between Dick Gephardt and Howard Dean had in 2004. They trained their fire on each other, and John Kerry snuck through one Iowa and won the nomination. It's also, our, uh, the poll shows that Donald Trump's supporters are disproportionately first-time caucus right. you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to interrupt you there because I'm going to get to that and I'm going to bring in Lisa to discuss exactly that subject because there are some interesting internal numbers in the poll and let's put this up. Among, uh, most of Trump's lead is among the 38% of those polled who say this will be the first time they go to the caucus. As you can see, 4319 among first-timers but only a three-point lead among traditional caucus goers, which Lisa raises the question, will those Trump supporters actually show up? And the truth is we just don't know. In some ways, this Iowa contest is the first big test of Trump's organization. This is a highly untraditional campaign and a highly untraditional organization. He's not doing any of the things, really, that you traditionally do in Iowa. So it's just not clear. Cruz is doing all those things. He set up Camp Cruz, which is, you know, sort of a, a sleepaway camp for all these volunteers who've come in to help him. He's doing exactly what you are supposed to do if the traditional rules apply in Iowa. It's just not clear the traditional rules apply at all, and that's what we're going to find out uh, when, when all these folks go to caucus. Now, George mentioned the fact that, and, and too late, uh, the question as to whether or not the Republican wing of the Republican Party has delayed too long in firing back against Donald Trump. Well, that ended this week. The National Review published a special edition called, and here you can see it, not very subtle, Against Trump, in which more than 20 conservative intellectuals railed against the front runner. But this week, Trump also got a big personal endorsement. Check this out. You ready for a commander in chief who will let our warriors do their job and go kick ISIS ass? So, Michael, who moves more votes, the thinkers at the National Review or Sarah Palin? I don't know. We'll find out once the voters uh, go to the polls. Look, good conservatives are split amongst all sorts of different candidates. What we have seen in the last week is that the establishment has become completely unified, and they're unified in trying to kill Ted Cruz. Um, Trent Lott, the Senate Majority Leader during all the wasteful spending of the Bush years, who helped shepherd No Child Left Behind through the Congress, has now become a lobbyist. He lobbies for Russian corporations. He came out and said he's going to do everything he can to stop uh, Ted Cruz. After the 2010 election, uh, which so many people were frustrated with Washington, D.C., and the kind of failed promises of 2010 and 2014, Trent Lott said, well, we're going to have a whole bunch of Jim DeMints coming to town, and we need to co-opt them. The Republican establishment... Well, it's not just Trent Lott. You've also had Bob Dole, who did an interview with the New York Times, which Absolutely. took off after Cruz. He did, and he got in the 1980 election to stop Ronald Reagan. 
um, back then. And so I think what you see is that the Republican establishment absolutely hates the fact that Ted Cruz has come to Washington. You, I he love has the not fact that you're leaving out Donald Trump. They don't like him either. Sure, and I think a lot of Donald Trump's appeal has been that he's been an anti-establishment uh, candidate. So that I was going to ask you, for the him. average voter, particularly for the grassroots Tea Party voter who you represent, it is being anti-establishment a plus or a minus? Oh, I think right now it's very clear that the two candidates who are, are duking it out are the most anti-establishment candidates. Donald Trump because of his personality, Donald Trump because of the things he's said, and Ted Cruz because of his conservative ideas, because he hasn't been co-opted. He's fought them. They hate that. And most importantly, they fear that Ted Cruz hasn't been able to be co-opted. Uh, before I bring in one, I want to ask you about one other question. I want you to take a look at a comment, an, an odd comment that Donald Trump made on the stump yesterday. Here it is the polls. They say, I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. So, Michael, you know, there are times in this campaign you just shake your head. Is that funny or alarming? Well, I mean, I think he meant it funny. It probably is funny. Um, there's certainly no evidence that it's not true at this point, but I think it's because Don Donald Trump has run a campaign breaking every single rule of politics that's what people want because every single rule of politics has gotten this country nineteen trillion dollars in debt you don't do that without a lot of bipartisanship you don't do that with a lot of and that's why ted cruz is so hated by the establishment that's why donald trump has taken off this is an anti-establishment year and it's a good thing that it is you're, an, you're endorsing cruz this morning it sounds like i'm endorsing an anti-establishment <laughs> oh, no, okay, well, i want to ask you a question well, no, no i'm just saying that trump you, the even chris said Washington, you, you don't mention got trump. Us into trouble all right Poor donald we, trump. we asked you for questions <laughs> for the <laughs> panel and we got this tweeted out to us by uh, a fellow, or a woman, I suppose, by the name Steelers Slob, who tweets this, are Donald Trump and Ted Cruz going to feel silly after, they've d after they're done tearing each other apart and Rubio eats their lunch? One, what do you say to Steelers Slob? And what do you make of this trial balloon that we see in the New York Times today that Michael Bloomberg might run as a third party independent candidate? Well, on the first score, let's just say the that... The Steelers slob. <laughs> yeah, George and I exchanged a look about that. Uh, that was very interesting. But anyway, the, on the politics of this, earlier you heard George mention what happened in the Democratic race some time ago when you had, uh, you know, Kerry sneak through that, is, that lane. And you have here Rubio as the leader of the establishment group, the Christie's, the Kasich, the Bush group. The problem here, Chris, feels like it's too little too late. He had a very good debate series. I think some might argue he's been the best on the stage when it comes to the Republican debates, and yet it has had almost no effect in terms of pushing him into the upper layer. It's clearly now between Trump and Cruz. And the other thing I would say is on the key issues here, he needs Cruz to fall apart, specifically immigration and the like. Cruz staying there right now is just eating up the opportunities for Rubio. And in 20 seconds, Michael Bloomberg. Well, I think Bloomberg has said it's all about Hillary Clinton for him. He thinks that if Hillary Clinton is able to best Bernie Sanders, if it's not a matter of Trump or Cruz uh, against then, Sanders, against Sanders, then he's not running. So he just needs that. He needs a big centrist open avenue before Correct. he'd consider doing it. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, panel. We'll see you all a little later.